can't get this thought out of my head. It's haunting me, scaring me, overwhelming me. It's getting out of control. I can't think clearly, I can't sleep, and I can't move forward. said that before? Maybe it was in a movie theater. You know, you're trying to watch a movie and someone won't be quiet. So you look at him, you're like, shh, I'm trying to watch a movie. Maybe you said these words, be quiet to your kids in a restaurant. You know, they're getting a little excited, a little rambunctious, and you just say, would you please be quiet? Silence is what we're after. And silence can be a healthy thing. I mean, if you're a parent, a grandparent, an aunt or an uncle, at some point in watching the kids, you just kind of long for silence, just stillness. But silence can also be a destructive thing, a painful thing. And over the course of the years in our culture, we've given those commands so much, shh, be quiet, shut up, that we've just kind of bought into that maybe we should just keep things on the inside. Keep things, maybe we should, shouldn't share most things, we should just be quiet. And where I want to start this morning is really hear this phrase that sets up this series, some things will hurt you if kept silent. And that is the truth today, that some things were just never meant to be kept within. They're supposed to be spoken about, communicated about. And in this series, Silent Killers, we're going to be talking about that concept over the next four weeks. We're going to be talking about some things that in our culture and in our lives that we've just chosen to keep inside when really we should be telling people about them. And over the course of the four weeks, we're not going to look at an exhaustive list, but we're going to look at probably some of the most common silent killers that a lot of us interact with on a regular basis. And so this morning, I believe that we're starting with the most common one. The one that it doesn't really matter what age you are, it doesn't matter who you are, you've probably most likely interacted with this silent killer at one place or another. Some of you deal with it every single day. It's the silent killer of worry, of worry. Even when you hear that word worry, you can immediately start to think about things that you've been worrying about, your kids, your future, your job. And worry simply means defined is divided mind. It's when your mind is split in two. It's divided and you can't control it. Two out of every five Americans deal with worry every single day. Now that might not seem like that high of a statistic. You might think, wow, that seems rather low. But notice the measurement there. That two out of every five individuals that you see, they interact with worry not on a regular basis, not on, on a once in a while occasion, but every single day. It consumes them. And maybe that's you today. You find yourself there where every single day you can't stop thinking about whether you're going to lose your job or not. You can't stop thinking about your kid's safety. You can't stop thinking about something, maybe your future spouse. You, you just, you're just worried. And I would never have called myself a worrier growing up and even into adulthood, but really two events changed that. The first one was I had kids. And it just, as parents, it just feels almost natural to worry about your kids, their safety, the, the things they're choosing at school. Like, it just feels normal to worry about your kids. And so as a parent, I worry. But the second event kind of added to that. You see, I was on a flight 
from Rochester to Dallas, Texas. And I love to fly. I love to travel. I travel on a fairly regular basis. Not a lot, but not a little. And so I'm on this flight. I've got a connector in Chicago. I get to Chicago, and we're headed on our way to Dallas. And it's smooth sailing. Everything's good. The pilot comes on, and he gives that you know routine speech, like we're beginning our initial descent. Everything looks good. We'll be in Dallas in 10 minutes. And so the stewardess come through, and they you know check your seatbelt, make you get in the most uncomfortable position, standing up front. And and you know you're so I, I'm ready to land, and we're getting closer and closer to Dallas. I can see the skyline, you hear the landing gear come out of the plane, and we're coasting into Dallas. And right when we're about to land, and right when I'm like relaxed, we're here, all of a sudden the pilot floors the engine. I mean, you could hear the roar of the engine, and we go straight up. I'm like, huh, this can't be good. And I just think, you know, maybe he overshot the runway, or maybe he needs to take his test again. I don't know. I've never flown a plane before. There's a reason for that. And so we start shooting up. And I know why we start going up when I look out my window and I see this gust of wind and clouds smash into our plane. And I use that word smash strategically because that's exactly what happened. You could hear it and you could feel it hit our plane. And our plane dropped and everybody's stuff flew everywhere. A lady started screaming and she used the name of Jesus and the F word in the same sentence. It was crazy. (laughs) It's like, I didn't even know that was possible. (laughs) And for the next five minutes, I thought I was going to die. It was crazy. The plane was shaking. It was going up and down. And I grabbed my armrest, just white-knuckled it, and I prayed that prayer. Maybe you've been there before. Lord, if you just get me through this, I'll serve you for the rest of my days. I will never sin again, God. Just, I want to live. And so we get through this, what they called, wind shear. And so we get through it, and the pilot comes on, and he tells us what's happening. He's like, hey, we're going to circle back around and try to land again. And I'm like, wait a second. Why are we going back towards the wind? Like, take me somewhere else. And so we go back around, and we try to land again, and we don't even get close, and we hit that wind shear again. Five minutes of agonizing, I have no clue what's going to happen. And so they send us to Austin, Texas. We land, spend five hours in the plane, and they bring us back to Dallas. It was awesome. (laughs) And you can imagine, every time I fly now, I'm worried. Anytime the word turbulence, or I feel a bump on a plane, it shakes me. And some of us, we can relate to that. Maybe not an airplane, but that's how we feel about certain things, certain events happening in our life right now. They consume us, and our heart gets to beating when we even begin to think about it, because we worry. And what's interesting about this silent killer is Jesus speaks directly to it in Matthew chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 6 is where we're going to be this morning. Matthew chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to provide one for you. It's going to be on page 787. You can keep notes and follow along in the Northridge app. It'll only take you a couple seconds to download. You can take notes on your program. Everything's going to be on the screen as well. And as you're making your way to Matthew chapter 6, I want to welcome you to Northridge Church. Whether you're joining us from one of our four campuses, you're with us online, or you're going to watch Watch this in a video later. Thanks for being here this morning. It's a beautiful spring. I'm not, wait, winter. You know what they call the season? Torture. And for all you people who are on social media, you know, posting like, I love snow in April. There's something wrong with you. But anyway, Matthew chapter 6, I had to get that out of my system. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus, this is a part of an even greater section in scripture. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. Where Jesus, over Matthew chapter 5 to Matthew chapter 7, Jesus has this crowd and he begins to teach these hot topics in culture. Things like divorce, things like how you should live, how you should handle your money, and worry. And what's interesting is if you look at Matthew chapter 6 verse 25, that's the passage we're going to look at. But if you go above it, you'll notice a section of scripture that we looked into just a couple weeks ago in our generosity series where Jesus talks about money. And I I find this really strategic on Jesus' part. 
Because when you think about worry, he's getting ready to talk about worry. And right before that, he talks about the thing that probably for most of us we worry the most about. Money. Finances. And so he begins in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. He says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? And I love where Jesus starts this message. I love where he starts. He just, he just lays it all on the table. He just kind of gives us a command. He says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. And it's clear. God makes it clear. It's a command. God says, don't worry. Don't worry. It shouldn't be a part of who you are. And, and he, what he does is he kind of just wipes all of our excuses away. Because it's easy to make excuses to worry. Oh, this is just who I am, God. Oh, this is just, I, it makes sense that I would worry about my kids or my job, God. They're important to me. I should worry about those things. And God says, oh, no. Actually, you shouldn't worry about anything. Do not worry. And I want you to understand that Jesus is not coming down with this iron fist, this command voice, like, don't worry. No, he's encouraging us. He's saying, hey, listen, there's a better way. He's not saying, I command you not to worry. He's saying, hey, I want you to understand, you don't have to worry because of who I am. You don't have to worry because there's a better way in life. And what he does through the next part of this message is he tells us the results of worry. He tells us how it impacts our life and what happens when we worry. And he actually continues, verse 26, it says this. It says, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they. And so Jesus begins by telling this illustration. He says, look at the birds. They don't gather, they don't sow or reap, and yet God provides for them. And then he says this phrase, he says, are you not much more valuable than they? And this is a rhetorical question. The answer is yes, because God places more value on humans than animals. And I know for all you pet lovers, that's hard to take, but it's true. In Genesis, you go back to Genesis, God creating all the world. The only thing he created in his own image was male and female. And so when Jesus looks at this crowd and he says, are you not more valuable than they? The answer is yes. God will provide for you. But I think it's strategic and intentional that Jesus uses that word valuable. Because when it comes to worry, why do we worry? It's because we've placed a value on something. We worry about things that are valuable to us. We worry about our kids because we love them. They're important to us. We worry about our future because it's important. We've placed a value on it. We worry about our finances because there's a value there. And Jesus is saying, hey, aren't you more valuable? We, we worry about the things we value. And he shows us what is revealed in our heart when we worry. You see, worry reveals a lack of trust in the value God places on us. When we choose to worry... It reveals the posture of our heart. It reveals that not only are we saying to God, hey, God, I don't trust you, but I don't trust the value you've placed on something that's important to me. I don't trust you, God, that you love my kids enough to protect them. When I worry, I say to God, I don't trust you enough to, to provide for me and my family through finances. You see, that reveals our heart. It reveals the lack of trust we have in God, not just in God, but the value that God places on certain things, things that are important to us. And I, I think we, we, we fail to remember that, you know, your kids that you worry about, you know how much you love them? God loves them more. And your finances that you worry about, your job that you worry about, do you realize that God loves to provide for you more than you love to provide for your family? And I, I think we, we fail to remember those things because I'm a dad, man. I can't imagine anybody loving my daughters and my son more than I do. But the reality is, is God does. God does. And when I worry about them, I just say, God, hey, I don't trust that you value them. It reveals our heart. But then Jesus asked this question, verse 27. It says, can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And I don't know about you, but I hate this question. Like, seriously, Jesus, you had to ask that question? Like, you had to pull the trump card out? Like, no, obviously the answer is no, and I don't want to talk about it right now, Jesus. Like, ugh. You know, you just get that, like, ugh. But Jesus reveals what worry does to us. 
He reveals the truth that we often forget about worry is this, you gain nothing from worry, yet it only steals from you. It only steals from you. I mean, how how true is that this morning? I mean, how many of us spend so much time worrying about something and we think our worry is going to change it, but the only thing that's actually happening is that worry that we place all of our energy and all of our time in is just stealing from us. And here's, here's a list of the, some of the things that worry steals from you. It steals from your relationships, your marriage, your, your family. It steals joy from your life. It steals from your faith. It steals from your sleep, your time, your energy, your health, your focus. You see, a lot of us, we spend a lot of time and energy worrying. Some of us, we can't sleep at night because we can't get that thought out of our head because we're worried. And we think that worry is going to change something, but the reality is, is the only thing worry is doing in your life is stealing from you. It's taking things that are actually valuable to you and removing them. And I've lived this out. Many of you know my wife and I, we're getting ready to finalize this adoption. We're getting ready to travel to China, fly to China. Can you imagine that? How I feel about planes. It's going to be wild. But now we have a picture of our son. We have a face, something that we've prayed for for five years. And now all we do is spend our time worrying about what they're feeding him, worrying about what he, how he's sleeping, if they're taking care of him. And you know what it's doing for us? It's stealing the joy of how much God has provided over the last five years. Because we're so busy, worried about the next step that we failed to stop, let go of our worry, and celebrate how much God values that boy in China. And we miss out. It steals from us. But Jesus continues. He says in verse 28, he says, And why do you worry about your clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? And again, God gives us another illustration. He uses the grass and the lilies to remind us of our value. He says, look at the grass and the lilies. You see how God clothes them? How much more then will he provide for you? But then he says a small penetrating phrase, this question. He says, you of little faith. And he shows us the impact of our worry on our lives, spiritually speaking. You see, worry cripples your faith. Worry destroys your faith. It holds it captive because of fear. At the end of the day, the reason why we worry is because we're afraid of something. We're afraid that our kids might not make the right choices. We're afraid that we might never get married. We're afraid that our future might have trouble in the horizon. We're afraid that we might lose our job. You see, we worry because there's fear there. It haunts us. It keeps us up at night. And that fear is destroying our faith. The very thing that God calls us to live in, your worry is keeping you from following him fully because it's destroying your faith. Fear holds you captive When you worry, it keeps you still. When God asks you to move, it holds you captive due to fear. Worry cripples faith. Jesus continues, verse 31. He says, so do not worry. He reminds you of that command. Hey, you don't have to worry. Do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. And so Jesus said, you don't have to worry. Because... Man, the things that we worry about are things that unbelievers chase after. We know God will provide for us. And so here's what I want to do for the rest of the time is I want to give you three reasons why we shouldn't waste our time worrying. And then I want to walk us through steps that we can take and win the battle over worry. And so three reasons why we shouldn't waste time worrying. The first one is worry is unhelpful. Worry is unhelpful. It doesn't work. Worry's never changed anything for you. In fact, get this. Some of you, you think if you worry about your past, it'll cover up those mistakes. You know, some of us, we have a past, and it haunts us, and we're afraid that it might be resurrected into our future, and so we worry about it. But we don't understand that our worry can't change those mistakes. 
So some of us, we worry about our future. But we fail to realize that worry can't control our future. As much as we worry about that, that future thing that we want, as much as we worry about getting that job or, or getting that spouse, as much as we worry about the future, our worry can't change the future. But do you know what worry can do? It can make you miserable today. It can't change your past. It can't control your future. But it will certainly make you miserable in your present. Worry never solved the problem. It only creates it because it's unhelpful. The second thing, worry is unnatural. And this might be a different spin on worry maybe that you haven't really dived into, but I want you to understand that you were not born a worrier. It's something that you've learned. Some of us, I hear so many people all the time say, you know, hey, I'm, I'm just a worrier. It's, it's who I am. No, that's false. It's something that you've learned over the course of life. You want to know how I know that? I have a three-year-old. And every day, this little girl named Joelle wakes up, and I guarantee you she doesn't wake up and say, man, I hope mom and dad can pay the mortgage this morning. <laughs> she doesn't wake up and say, man, I hope we have breakfast on the table. You know what she does? She says, daddy, I'm hungry because she knows her father is going to provide for her. She doesn't worry. But yet, some kids do worry. Kids in the foster care system, they worry because they've learned, because they've been taken out of their home, and they wonder and they worry about when the next time they're going to be ripped out of another home. And it's the same for all of us, is we've learned the response of worry through circumstances, through events in our life. It cause this reaction, this response in our heart and in our minds to worry. It's much like a muscle. If you think about the muscles in your body, we go to the gym to stretch, to strengthen our muscles. And the more you go, the stronger that muscle gets. And worry is much like a muscle. And I'm afraid for a lot of us, it's the strongest muscle in our arsenal. Because we've spent so much time stretching and strengthening the muscle of worry that here's what's happened. Something that was unnatural, something that we learned, has now become our natural response. The reason why we shouldn't waste time with it is because it was unnatural for us. Third, worry is unnecessary. Worry is unnecessary. I mean, if you know Christ is your personal Savior, you've placed your faith and trust in God, worry is unnecessary. Because here's, here's the reality. If you really trust God with your finances, if you really trust God with your kids, if you really trust God with your life, why waste your time worrying? If you really allow God to be the God of your life, if you allow God to provide for you, there's really no sense in worrying. Because your trust shouldn't be in you anyway. It should be in God. And so worry is unnecessary. It's unhelpful. It's unnatural. But then comes the question for me and for all of us. Because I think, man, if we're honest, we're all worriers. Maybe in a season we take a break, but we are all worriers. We worry about something or someone. How do we win this battle? I mean, how do we win this battle with something that I deal with every single day or on a weekly basis? How do I overcome this? Well, at the end of the message, Jesus gives us insight to that. Verse 33, he says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And so I want to give you three steps that I think we can walk in every single day that will help us win this battle. And I think the first one is found in this passage. It says, think about truth, not uncertainty. Think about truth, not uncertainty. You see, for a lot of us, we worry because we are uncertain of something. We don't have the knowledge or we don't know what's about to take place. And so it causes us to worry. We worry about our future because we don't know what the future is. We worry what our future spouse is going to be like because we don't know who she or he is. We worry about if we're going to lose that job or not because we have no clue what's going to take place. We worry about the diagnosis from the doctor that we haven't seen yet because there's uncertainty there. And to overcome your worry, it, it really means we have to shift our gaze. We have to shift our focus because a lot of us, we spend a majority of our time focusing on something that we don't know, something we can't control, and it consumes us. And what Jesus is saying, he says, hey, first, seek my kingdom and its righteousness. Jesus says, hey, take your eyes off of uncertainty and start 
focusing back on me. Start focusing back on the truth of God's word. And so here's what that means practically. The next time the enemy tries to tempt you with worry, he tries to put fear in your mind, all you got to do is remi- remind the devil of the promises that God has already spoken in his word, that he loves you, that he'll walk with you, that he'll fight the battle for you. And so no matter what comes, you just remind your fear, you remind your uncertainty, you remind the enemy of all the promises God has in his word for you. So we stand on truth. We don't stand on shifting sand of uncertainty. We stand on the word of God and the promises of God that will never shift, that will never be shaken, and it won't change. So we stand and we shift our focus off the things that we can't control, and we shift it back to the one who does control. Secondly, we understand that trouble will come and worry won't change that. We understand that there is trouble in life, trouble will come, and there's nothing that we can do to change that. This is what it says in the verse. It says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And and, and this is what I I love about the Bible, because the Bible is real. The Bible is raw, and it's relevant. And the Bible doesn't sugarcoat anything for you. I mean, as much as I would love for this verse to say like, hey, you don't have to worry about tomorrow because God is going to make today good. I mean, I wish that that's what the verse read. I would be awesome. Like, man, you don't have to worry about tomorrow because guess what? God's going to provide everything that you desire. Man, that would be a a better verse. Amen? Amen? But that's not what it says. The Bible doesn't shy away from truth. In fact, it declares it. He says, hey, Don't worry about tomorrow because today has enough trouble on its own. And and that's the reality of life. This trouble for some of us might be right around the corner. And the Bible doesn't shy away from that. It says, hey, deal with today because you don't know what tomorrow will bring. And and we we just have to understand that in this lifetime, there's going to be hardships. There's going to be circumstances that we don't want to face that we're going to have to. And the reality is, whether we worry about it or not, it won't change that. And I think we spend so much time thinking our worrying is going to change. And and one thing that we're going to do throughout this series is as we encounter hard things and and as we walk through this battle of worry, our equip ministry, which is the ministry where we dig a little bit deeper into God's word, we're going to be sending out some resources, some Bible memory stuff that will help you when you face fear and when you face, when you get get a desire to to worry after something. And so if you aren't a part of that equipped ministry, you can check that box, write down your name and your email, and we will send these these resources to you. If you're watching online, just click that that connect tab and we give us your email. We will send those to you. But we have to understand that trouble is going to come and worry won't change that. And then finally, the next step we got to take is we have to submit to God's way, not your way. Submit to God's way, not your way. And I know I could say this every single week for every single message. Submit to God, surrender to God's way, not your way. But I want to take us to another level of intimacy with God, especially when it comes to worry. And I think this is a level of intimacy that a lot of Christians just miss out on. Because when it comes to worry, when I think about my life, the things that I worry about the most are the things I'm most afraid to lose. I mean, at the end of the day, the things that I really spend my time and haunt my mind are the things that I'm scared to death to lose. The thing I worry about the most is my family, my kids, my wife. I mean, I spend a lot of time thinking and, 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 and wondering and, and worrying about them. In fact, it, it, it showed itself just this past week in Easter. My wife's Meemaw died, and she had to travel about 27 hours in three days to make the funeral. And that's a lot of time in a car. And, you know, I trust my, well, I trust my wife's driving, kind of. (laughs) Sorry, babe. But, man, I was worried. She had our our youngest daughter with her. That's a lot of time to be on, on the roads with people who I don't trust their driving. And so you know what I did? I did the spiritual thing. I worried. <laughs> I mean, I did. I, I wish I could tell you I didn't. This is something that I deal with. I, I worried about my wife being. Because you know what? At the end of the day, I, I am afraid. And I don't know how I would handle losing them. It's my greatest fear. And I think it's true for a lot of us. 
is the thing that we worry about the most is the thing we're most afraid to lose. Maybe for you it is your family or your, your finances, your money. What would I do without that? And we worry about it because we're afraid to lose it. And when I say submit to God's way and not your way, I want to teach you a, a whole other level of intimacy with God. When you can look at your Savior and you can say, God, here's my kids. And I know I have a plan for their life. And that plan is comfort. And that plan is safety. And that plan is purpose. And that plan is protection. But I'll let go of that and allow you to control it. Your finances. God, my plan for my finances is having a lot. My plan for my finances is never losing my job. My plan for my finances is to be comfortable. But I'm okay surrendering that and allowing you to determine what, is, what you have for me. You see, that's a whole nother level of intimacy with God that I think a lot of Christians, a lot of Christ followers never get to where we take our hands off of our plans for the things that we love the most, the things that we're afraid to lose, and to say, God, okay, I'm letting go, and I don't care what you do with this, I'll follow you. Even if you take my kids, even if you take my finances, even if you take my future, God, you and your way, not my way. That is what I mean when I say submit to God's way, not yours. Because I think it's easy in some areas. Like, oh, sure, God, you can have that. I don't really care about that. But what about the things that I love the most? You see, we overcome worry when we shift our gaze back to truth. We understand troubles come and worry won't change that, and we submit to God. You know, a French writer wrote this quote, and I thought this was just mind-blowing. He says this. He says, my life has been filled with terrible misfortunes, most of which never happen." How true is that? I read a a study this week from the Huffington Post, did a couple years ago. They did a study on worry. And check out this statistic. It might blow your mind. It blew my mind. 85% of what we worry about never happens. Wow. I mean, you've probably been there. I've been there before. I mean, how many times have I diagnosed myself with cancer? (laughs) You're all laughing because you've been there. How many times have I pictured a car accident happening, but it never actually did? What would I do with all that energy and all that time I wasted worrying about those things? Now, what if I got that back, all that sleep I lost worrying about something that never, according to statistics, ever happened? What would my life look like if I let go of the worry and got back that 85% of my energy and my joy and my faith? If I could just get it back, what do you think God could do with that? But what's interesting is what happens to the other 15%? 85% actually never happens. What about the 15% that does happen? You see, this is what the study said. It said the 15% that actually did happen, 79% of people discovered either they could handle the difficulty better than expected or the difficulty taught them a lesson worth learning. Wow. The very thing that I'm scared of the most might be the very thing God wants to use in my life to make me a better man or a better follower of him. So what are you afraid of? What are you worried about? What keeps you up at night? What's haunting your dreams? You can't get it out of your mind. What is it for you? You know, maybe the first step for a lot of us is just this week going to our community group and breaking the silence and saying, you know, I'm a worrier. Will you pray with me? Will you hold me accountable? Will you help me win this battle? Maybe for some of us, that's just the first step. As we go to community group this week and we dialogue about this message, and we just say, hey, I'm going to be honest and real. Imagine that in community group with people we trust saying, hey, actually, this is who I am and I need help. And saying, hey, I'm going to break the silence. Would you help me? If you're not in the community group, man, check that box on your connection card. We will get you plugged in because we're not a church that offers groups. We are a church of small groups. And we want to help you apply God's word, build relationships, and care for one another. So what are you worried about? What's haunting you? Today, would you make a conscious decision? 
a decision in your heart and in your head and in your body and in your soul to say, God, this isn't easy, but I'm going to let go of this thing that I'm most afraid of losing, and I'm going to place it in your hands today, and I'm not going to worry about it anymore. I'm going to get back the 85% that I've been losing on a regular basis. Because if you don't, that worry just might end up destroying you. Let's pray. Lord, this isn't an easy battle. And God, I think it's something that we all deal with. We all fight with. And God, I pray that you just give us the courage to shift our gaze back on you to focus on solid ground, not shaking ground. To remind us that trouble comes, but you're there, that you promise to provide for us and care for us and love us through the battle. And so we, I pray that you would help us overcome our worry this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.